Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 103. Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. Our first song this morning is requested a lot at the Kairos Prison Ministries. So would you please sing with me? 10,000 reasons.
singing this beautiful song, Hope and Glory. And I just invite you this morning to take these words into your heart because we would be so lost with our Lord and Saviour. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. Not only was the teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. The words of the wise are like goads. Their collected sayings like firmly embedded nails, given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Of making many books there is no end, and much study wearies the body. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God, and keep His commandments for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. In March 2007, I got on an airplane that was going to fly to Australia, and I did not know how that decision would change the entire course of my life. I did not know how the choice would unfold at that time, but that one decision that I made when I was 18 led to consequential decisions. Uh, in 2015, I gave up my Korean citizenship 
to become Australian. In 2016, I married Gabi, who I met here. And in 2018, I met, uh, well, uh, my son Daniel was born at the Gold Coast Hospital. That one decision that I made when I was 18 made me a person, husband, and father that I am today. People say life is a sum of all your choices. According to a study, a typical adult makes uh, 27 decisions a day, starting with the weather to turn off the alarm in the morning. And the average person makes nearly 800,000 decisions over a lifetime, and he or she regrets 150,000 of them. What's astonishing is each decision of them can take up to 9 minutes, which means a typical adult spends 4 hours just working out what to do every day. Now, what do you think? If your life is a sum of all your choices and the entire course of your life could change based on one single choice, wouldn't you want to be a person who makes right decisions? Would you say you generally make wise decisions in life? Then what enables us to make the right decisions? Well, to make the right decision, we need wisdom. What is wisdom? A wisdom simply means the ability to discern what is right from what is wrong. It is a gift which gives us the capability, uh, capability to make the right decision. Wisdom is, however, not quite the same as knowledge. For example, everyone around this time is aware of social distancing rules and isolation measures and the importance of them. And most people at the present time are trying to abide by those rules. But we hear and see on the news some young, spirited sports stars ignore the rules and get criticized publicly. Knowledge and intelligence is not the same as wisdom. If knowledge is a power, then wisdom is using that power the right way. Then where do we get wisdom from? Wisdom is sourced from all sorts of places, but Christians would say the main source of wisdom is the Bible. In particular, there are three wisdom books in the Old Testament which has been put together by Jews. They are Proverbs, Job, and Ecclesiastes. Proverbs, Job, and Ecclesiastes, they all basically say human beings have a limited understanding of what is right and what is bad. But there is one who created the universe and he knows everything. The key message of the biblical wisdom literature is simple. It is wisdom comes from fearing God who created the universe and obeying his commandments. In Isaiah 55, it, it's put in this way. God's wisdom is like the sky and ours is like the earth. His ways are higher than our ways and His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Last week, we talked a little bit about the book of Ecclesiastes in particular. It is a very interesting book to read. Its key message is the same as Proverbs and Job. But as we looked at last week, Ecclesiastes has its own unique way of understanding life and death. It says life is a havel, which is translated as meaningless in most English Bible translations, yet it does not quite capture the idea. The Hebrew word havel literally means vapor or smoke. So when Ecclesiastes says, Life is meaningless. It does not mean life is worthless, but it means life is like a wisp of smoke. It tells us that nothing that we do here for ourselves matters at the end, as all come from dust and to dust all return. So Ecclesiastes tells us, make 
most out of your life. And the way you do that is to live for God, not for yourself. To enjoy life is to enjoy it in God. Live a life God's way, not your way. And that's the wisdom that Ecclesiastes teaches us. This morning, we are going to the last part of the book, which gives us a summary of all it is said in the Ecclesiastes. It is the highest of the wisdom that it offers us. It says in the last verse, Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind, for God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Last year, I had a privilege of sitting at the bedside of four people who were on the verge of death. I would not say it is a pleasure, but it is certainly a privilege to be with the people at that stage of life. You know, when death takes us, it puts our personal beliefs and our worldviews to the test. I have seen people who are devastated at the point of death. Sadly, my grandmother was one of them. She was not a believer, and she was afraid that we would forget her and she would be nothing after all. She was afraid that there really is something after she dies. She was afraid that she would not be good enough to go to a good place. Last year, I had somebody actually said this to me at the end of their life. The person said, Noah, I don't know if I have done enough to pass the test. As a pastor, my heart breaks when I see people who haven't got any way to deal with the fear of death near the end of their lives. But this verse that we are looking at this morning points to hope. It points to the highest of all wisdom. This verse offers us a worldview or ultimate strategy to destroy the fear of death. And this morning, let's look at it closely. The most commentators agree that the author wasn't particularly thinking about what happens after death when he wrote this verse. Many think it was a Solomon who wrote this, although the authorship is questionable. Whoever the writer was, at the point of the time he wrote this, he had a limited revelation. Though he believed God is the ultimate judge, he did not know on what basis God would make a judgment and he was not thinking about what happens after we die. Just like Moses who wrote the story of creation in the book of Genesis without fully understanding it, Solomon wrote this verse under the influence of God's Spirit without fully understanding it. His revelation was limited at the point of the time. But we, uh, we have got a full revelation. We know what God meant when He gave this verse through Solomon. Paul, years later, writes this in 2 Corinthians 5.10 that it would be before Christ all our decisions made in this life would be brought into judgment. Paul writes this. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. In other words, what the Bible tells us is, we all stand before the judgment seat, but Christ saves us. It says, to know this Savior is the highest of all wisdom. To know Christ is actually to fear God and obey His commandments. To know Christ is the best decision that we can ever make in life, and Christ is how we make the most out of life here on earth. It says to know God is the ultimate strategy to destroy any kind of fear in this life, and even fear of death. You may recall this. 
In the very first sermon Peter preached on the Pentecost, he addressed the big crowd and he preached the gospel. He said, this man, Jesus, was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death. Because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Here the word hold is an interesting word. It literally means grip. It means strength or power. Peter says here, when Jesus died on the cross and rose again, he broke the strong grip of death. He broke its power. What it means is death no longer had any right over him because he paid a penalty. Uh, one of the ways you can put it in is this. Let's just say you commit a crime and the penalty for that crime is two years in prison. Because you've committed a crime and that crime is not paid for, the prison has a hold on you. It has a power over you. It has a right to keep you and it, you, you will stay in there. But on the first day of the third year, the prison cannot hold you because the debt has been paid. It has no power over you. It cannot keep you one more minute. You are free. When Jesus breathed his last on the cross and rose from the dead, it was God's way of saying, not only has he paid the debt, but also everyone else who believes in him has paid the debt. It says in Hebrews 10, Jesus died and he's made a sacrifice once for all. The key idea of the cross is that Jesus died as a substitute for us. He died the death we deserved that we may gain a new life and live with the eternal God. To get this theology a bit more animated, let me put it this way. In the last part of the first chapter in Keller's book on death, he comments on Hebrews chapter 12, where it says, Jesus is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Here the word pioneer is, in Greek translation, archigos, and it literally means a champion. The picture we get here is Jesus is going into battle. He is going into an arena like a Colosseum of Romans to fight fierce animals. He is going into death and he goes in, fights the animal and defeats it and he destroys its ability to hurt anybody else. He is a champion. You know, when David and Goliath fought, they fought as champions. They fought as substitutes for their respective armies. So if David won, then the victory was going to be imputed to the entire army. If Goliath won, then the victory was going to be imputed to his army. Champion in the context of battle means Either their defeat or their victory was going to be imputed to their entire army. And we know the story. When David and Goliath fought, David won and his entire army won. And of course, Jesus Christ is the true David and he is a true champion and he faced death for us and he fought it as our substitute and he destroyed it. Now, those who know this champion, those who know Christ and have him in the heart, they already met death. They already destroyed its power, its grip, its strength through their champion. Our champion won the victory. He defeated death. In him and through him, we also defeated death. He died the death that we deserved that we may live. Friends, do you believe this? 
He's already paid our debt and he paid a penalty that we may confidently enter the room and stand before the judgment seat of God. We have nothing to be afraid of. Do you believe this? Do you really believe that Jesus died for you? The way that we can truly handle the suffering and the fear of death in this life is to remember Jesus died for us because He loves us. That is our strength, that is our power, and that is our wisdom. You know, John Stott, an English Anglican priest who led one of the most impactful worldwide evangelical movements in the 20th century, once confessed to this. He said he used to just imagine that because Jesus had died, the world had been automatically put right. When someone told him that Christ had died for him, he was contemptuous and responded haughtily. He said, everyone knows that, as if the fact itself or his knowledge of the fact had brought him salvation. But later on in his life, he realized that for that knowledge that Jesus died for him to have a real changing power inside you, you must receive it and take it to your heart, not just intellectually agree. Years ago, there was a big Vietnam veterans parade in Chicago in America. Part of the commemoration was a mobile version of the Vietnam Wall. The wall had names of all the soldiers who had died in Vietnam. And one of the newscasters asked a vet why he had come all the way to Chicago to visit this memorial and participate in the parade. The soldier looked straight into the face of the reporter and with the tears flowing down his face. And, and in, he pointed the name of a friend in the wall. And as he stood there, he traced the letters of his friend's name in the wall. And as he was tracing the name of his friend with his finger, he said, I came because this man right here gave his life for me. He gave his life for me. Letting his tears flow, he said to the reporter, As I am getting older, it is hard for me to get my heart and my mind around the sacrifice of my friend, so I keep retracing the story. You know, the reason why we get worried so easily, we get despondent and disappointed so easily, and we get afraid so easily in this life, even though we believe in God, is we forget how much God loves us, and He died the death we deserved. We may know intellectually, but when our heart gets cold toward that truth, life feels so weighty and heavy to endure again. I know this from my own experience. I have that problem too. I don't want to grow dull to Jesus' death for me, but I do. You know, our fight is not against the flesh and blood. They will be gone one day anyway. Ultimately, our fight is not against our sickness. It is not against our financial strife. It is not against depression. We will have trouble sooner or later in this life. And please understand I am saying this sensitively and gently. But in this life, our aim is to stay connected to Jesus. That is the highest of all wisdom. He is the vine and we are His branches. Without Him, we cannot bear any fruit. In Romans 8, Paul says, There is nothing about us or our life that His love cannot reach. It says, even death cannot separate us from the love of God. He died for you. He died for you. 
He died for you. His love is for you. Do you truly, truly, truly believe this? Every Sunday, when we gather as a worshiping community, this is what we do. We get our hearts and our minds around the sacrifice and resurrection of our friend and Savior Jesus. Each Sunday, you retrace your story of Jesus and His heartwarming and transforming love in the presence of your family. Each Sunday, we trace the letters of the name of Jesus, looking at the cross, and we remember, yes, I must not forget. Jesus died the death I deserved, and He now lives in me. His resurrecting power, resurrecting life, runs through my vein, and I am made new because of Him. Nothing but the blood of Jesus is a real power. Nothing but the blood of Jesus is a real strength that we can face the world that is full of problems and sufferings with. Nothing but Jesus Christ is a real champion who has defeated the worst enemy of us all, namely death. Therefore, can give us a transcendent hope and peace in this life. It is Communion Sunday today. It is a day that we remember the sacrifice and the gift of Jesus by sharing symbolic elements, bread and wine. What is significant about Communion is, it was instituted by Jesus himself. And it is the only regular commemorative act authorized by him. Jesus did not tell his disciples to commemorate his birth or his teaching. He did not tell his disciples to commemorate his transfiguration or resurrection, but he told them to regularly share a meal with others in remembrance of his death. He told them to have his memorial service regularly as they give thanks. Why? And that is because his death for us is what is the most spiritually significant and has a cosmic impact. Paul says the cross is the explosion of God's power. Jesus himself wanted his death to be the center of the faith of those who believe in him. At last supper, Jesus predicted his own death. It meant he voluntarily laid his life on the cross. And he said the bread that he broke was his body given for us in death. And wine, his blood poured out for us. And he said, eat and drink. As we come to him, he does not want us to be spectators but participants. He does not just want us to intellectually agree with him but wholeheartedly receive Him. This morning, I invite you to share this meal in remembrance of Christ's sacrifice and His gift of life and take this meaning of communion wholeheartedly and participate. As we retrace the story and take it to our hearts this morning, as we eat and drink from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ this morning, I believe that our hope, our love, and our joy will be renewed and you will experience the power of God's presence. Oh
Christ invites us all to this table who love Him, repent of their sin, and seek to live with one another in peace. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for these symbolic elements that are before us. We give you thanks for the bread and wine. As you did at the Last Supper with your first disciples, we ask that you would bless these elements and make yourself and your presence known to us in the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the cup. You, Jesus, live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he had a last supper with his disciples. And he took the, he took the bread and broke it. And he gave thanks and said to his disciples, This is my body broken for you. Do this in the remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and said, This is my blood poured out for you. The cup is the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the gospel. We proclaim the death and sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ until he returns. If you have elements before you this morning, let us take them together. This is the body of Christ broken for us. Amen. And this is the blood of Jesus Christ poured out for us. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for your sacrifice and your death. We thank you for the bread and wine by which you feed us on the journey with you and to you. Father, we thank you that through this sacrament, you have given us a foretaste of heavenly banquet that we will one day share with you face to face. Amen. Let us pray a prayer that Jesus has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Friends, thanks for joining us today. Let me send you with a prayer of blessing. Father, as we go into the world, let us go in confidence and hope, knowing that you love us, and you died for us, yet you rose again and now live in us. May the love of the Father, the tenderness of the Son, and the presence of the Holy Spirit gladden your heart and bring peace to your soul this day and all days.